<laughs> right. Okay, then just to emphasize that point, in around 590 <laughs> BCE or something like that, yeah. Christian Jews are coming over and becoming Christians in America. That we'll get we'll we'll get back to that. That's an incredible. Yeah, we'll get back to that. That's incredible. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with Dan Vogel. He's the author of many books on early Mormon history. Many is an understatement. He's a bachelor's degree at, from the University of California at Long Beach, and he's published around 30 volumes. You know when someone says around, that's a lot, uh, when, you, when you've lost count, and about the same number of journal articles. Uh, I would don't think it's an exaggeration to say Dan Vogel is one of not the foremost expert on early Mormon history. I've watched a lot of videos and read a lot of material where people quote you both um, people who are within the Mormon world. And then though it's interesting. I saw one scholar who quoted you referenced your work and he, he calls you the revisionist historian, Dan Vogel. And I, and I'd like you to comment on that term revisionist. I, I'm not sure what he means by that. Um, and then, you know, others who are, um, uh, who are maybe more taking a critical approach, will just, you know, refer to you as Dan Vogel. And um, w- one of the uh, major works that you, you have done is um, you've gone through and tracked down a lot of the early sources on Mormonism. And, and I've done a little bit of reading. This isn't my expertise, obviously. Um, but I've done a lot, uh, quite a bit of reading and, and seen a lot of historians before you would pick like little things here and there and then you went through systematically. T- tell us about, about that, uh, bringing all of these sources. And there's an abundance of sources. It's incredible. Well, that was one of the first things I did uh, when I was still in the university, actually, um, is to try to gather all the sources dealing with Mormon origins and put them all into one place. And I produced five volumes over a period of uh, time. And so I wanted to um, give everyone the, the sources to work with, plus the annotations of who everybody is and uh, introductions to each of these documents. As it turned out, it was five volumes. I didn't know how much there would be, but I noticed that a lot of people were having to retrace their steps every time anybody wrote on this period and it, it's very it was very difficult to get a hold of all these documents mm-hmm. and um, I had some older friends that had been doing uh, early Mormon history before me yeah. I, was, I was just in my 20s wow. and, yeah um, and I noticed that well they had quite a uh, a vast collection of documents themselves before I started, and they allowed me to use their uh, archives, their personal archives, and I uh, started from there and then moved out, and I went, did a lot of traveling around the United States to gather documents to historical societies and uh, court ha- old courthouses and jails. Wow. And, uh, wow. you know, I just wanted to know everything before I wrote my a biography of Joseph Smith, the found, Mormon founders, um, uh, early history, which I eventually did after I collected those five volumes. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, uh, Joseph Smith, the Making of a Prophet. Mm-hmm. So, so here's why I'm so interested in this topic. Let me let me explain because the audience is thinking, why on earth is Nehemiah talking about <laughs> Mormonism? Why I'm interested is. Uh, my main field is the is the Tanakh or the Old Testament, the the Hebrew Bible, and I also do a lot of uh, stuff on the New Testament. And I dabble, just barely dabble in in Islam, just because it's you know one of the three great Abrahamic religions. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have zero information about Moses from his time, other than the Torah, which you could debate whether you know scholars will debate whether Moses had anything to do with the Torah, or whether he existed. Mm-hmm. I believe he did, but that's a, a faith statement, not a uh, academic statement. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus, we know a little bit more. We have things from, you know, within a hundred years, um, more from his, about his followers where the Romans will say, you know, there are these people causing trouble who follow this, uh, uh, you know, person named Crestus. They don't even call him Christ, right? Um, in the earliest sources. And then for Islam, we don't, really don't have anything for the first 200 years of almost nothing. But for Joseph Smith within, who's the founder, Joseph Smith Jr., who's the founder of Mormonism, uh, and, and this I found confusing, there's his father, Joseph Smith, 
who's senior, yeah. and then his son, yeah. who's also a leader of Mormonism, the third, and then there's his nephew, who is Joseph Fielding Smith. That's confusing if you're not from the field. But Joseph Smith Jr., who we'll just call Joseph Smith for the rest of this discussion, unless we're being specific about his father or something. Um, so we have things from... I mean, we have his trial records from, from before he even wrote the Book of Mormon or translated according to believers in Mormonism, the Book of Mormon. I mean, it's the type of thing you would dream about for studying Moses or Jesus or Mohammed. <laughs> uh, so I think it's an incredible analogy on just so many levels, um, both an analogy and a contrast, right? Um, look, if you, if you believe in Islam then you believe that angel Gabriel, and I might be getting this wrong because I'm not an expert in Islam, but you, I think they believe the angel Gabriel dictated the Quran to, Mo, to the prophet Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. And Mormons believe, well, actually, you'll tell us what early Mormons believe, hopefully, uh, or what you think early Mormons believe about how Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. But it's incredible that we have people offering, uh, or not just offering, pushing an alternative narrative and saying, no, that's a lie. And they're writing this within... I think even less than a year of when the Book of Mormon was published. Is that is that right? Actually, a newspaper accounts appeared before the book was published. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's incredible. In 1829, yes. in 1829 it was published in, in uh, March of 1830. Wow, so, and he almost got into a fist fight over someone who was trying to plagiarize or steal the Book of Mormon and publish it yeah. in his newspaper. It's incredible stuff. Well, you know... <laughs> You would think you would be in a better uh, situation with so much being published, but it's still hotly contested just about mm -hmm. every little thing involved with the uh, early Mormon uh, origins is hotly right. contested. There's a whole group of apologists trying to defend the traditional view. And the traditional view really doesn't appear until uh, like 1838 with Joseph Smith's mm -hmm. uh, writing his official history. Mm -hmm. But before 1838, there was quite an evolution that comes up, and the apologists want to try to make it appear that nothing had changed that much, mm -hmm. you know, uh, during that period of time. And people like me, uh, scholars like me, who study uh, Mormon origins, uh, like to uh, focus on the development of ideas, and that Joe Smith did, it just didn't pop out. Uh, you know, the way it is taught, uh, even in 1838, let alone today, and it gets ch changes it continually occur. But Joseph Smith used uh, the writing of history, his own history, to shape his story as time went on and to change it into a more mainstream Christian story. Uh, before that, it was kind of non traditional mixture of uh magic you know uh folk magic when i talk about magic i'm talking about folk magic or ceremonial magic is joseph smith's uh, early uh training as a uh, a treasure seer mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get into that no doubt I, you know let, let let's get it oh, i'm sorry i don't want to interrupt well and then then the, then as time went on mm -hmm. his little particular culture in which Mormonism uh, was planted and nourished and started growing, uh, that little culture was too narrow to attract a larger audience. And so the story finally, uh, as time went on, lost those particular cultural attributes and became more and more uh, not totally mainstream Christianity, but mm -hmm. more appealing to a larger audience of early of Christians in America, mm -hmm. the way the so, way they view yeah. things anyway at that time yeah. in the nineteenth century. So, um, talk to me about. Um, so, I think it was Richard Bushman, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. who calls you a revisionist historian, which is ironic because, in some ways, compared to. Um, Mormons up until his time, he's a revisionist or considered by some a revisionist historian. I know there's this one yeah. apologist who calls him a you know the liberal historian. So what what does he mean by that revisionist historian? Well, he's a, he's a serious historian himself, mm -hmm. even yeah. though he has apologetic uh, uh, leanings. Mm -hmm. But he he can be considered a revisionist by more conservative Mormon interpreters. Right. Um, mm -hmm. 
because he concedes, he appears to concede too much to the critical uh, minded more uh, Mormon historians. Mm-hmm. And uh, a revisionist just to me means that I'm um, trying to pull the story back to mm-hmm. its origins uh, and um, trying to give a different, more complete picture of how Mormonism developed and rather than the finished version, the tra- which has become the traditional version. So I'm not um, repeating the traditional story or the um, um, the uh, official account. Mm-hmm. And that way I've, I appear to be revisionist because I'm revising their traditional accounts that they mm-hmm. have grown up in and repeated so many times in their meetings and uh, schools and things. Uh, and it, so it sounds odd to them, but all I'm doing is just telling the story as, as it was. Originally. Would it be fair to call what you do? Uh, uh, and I, I think probably the apologists won't appreciate this or maybe they will. I don't know what you do is, is it more a, a critical approach to history versus a traditionalist approach? Would you yeah. say that's so, so tell us what, so, so I think a lot of my audience has no idea even, you know, who Joseph Smith Jr. was when yeah. the Book of Mormon was written. Maybe start with what the traditional approach is, and if you can, yeah. and then contrast this with, with what you discovered about who Joseph Smith was in the Book of Mormon. And I know that's, uh, you know, might take 12 hours, but <laughs> let, let's get the short version and then maybe yeah. we'll delve down into some, into some details. Yeah, so Joseph Smith, he was born in 1805 and uh, had a a fairly uh, normal existence with his parents uh, being uh, uh, religious, just like any other uh, people that have developed from the Puritan stock anyway. And, uh, but they became themselves a little uh, wary of organized religion. Mm -hmm. And so when Joseph Smith grew up, he grew up in Western New York mm-hmm. and in Western New York was known as the burned over district because there were so many revivals going on at that time, mm. camp meetings and revivals and people were fired up about religion in the uh, early 1820s and late 18, teen, you know, 18, 19, 20 period. And Joseph Smith was confused about which uh, church to join. And he uh, finally made it a matter of prayer. And he went to the woods near his farm in uh, Palmyra, New York, actually Manchester, which is a neighboring town, and uh, prayed. And then he claimed later to have a vision. And the vision was of God, the Father, and Jesus Christ standing next to him. And he asked which church he should join, and they told him to join none of them because they were all an abomination. Their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and uh, not to join any. And so Joseph Smith left that uh, vision, uh, just pondering it for several years. Until 1823. And in 1823, he decided to pray again in his room. Uh, and an angel appeared to him. Mm-hmm. An angel uh, later identified as Moroni. And Moroni was, as it turned out, the last author, the last writer, the last prophet of the Book of Mormon. And all this is the standard narrative, what you're telling us, right, yes. the, of the church. Yeah, I'm telling you sort of okay. like what they would tell it. Um, and the first one they call the first vision, and then the Moroni, what do they call the Moroni one? Is that called the second vision? Or? Yeah. Well, uh, it, they would, yeah, some people do, but okay. it has no special, not like okay. the first vision uh, story that, Mm-hmm. Uh, has become known as the, the first vision with capital letters. And, and letter. calling it the first vision, that's that's charged with this, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that sort of charged with this idea like in, in the entire history of mankind, at that point, God decided to do something different 
and the first vision was like was the uh like the opening salvo of of this restoration is that yeah so it? when when god uh, or jesus christ told joseph smith that the the creeds were an abomination that was kind of like all the religious world is in apostasy mm -hmm. okay they're oh wow they're re spiritually and religiously dead and that it the hint is that joseph joseph smith is going to be the restorer of the true church mm -hmm. true, true christian church mm -hmm. and although there was never one real true christian church but uh he um uh this is the 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 uh connotation that is later given to the first vision that and it's also it's all implied because you know the end of the story you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're in his bedroom and Moroni appears to yeah, him according to maybe, standard narrative. What happens next? So Moroni is supposed to be uh, the last prophet in this Book of Mormon that occurred, uh, that was written here in America from about 600 BC to 400 AD. And uh, they were Christians that came over from Israel, from Jerusalem, actually. And they had a history and they wrote about it and they included in their book, you know, all the true doctrines of Jesus and Christianity, even though it was BC. Right. But, okay. Then just to emphasize that point in around 590 <laughs> BCE or something like that, yeah. Christian Jews are coming over and becoming Christians in America. That, we'll get, we'll, we'll get back to that. That's an incredible, yeah, we'll get back to that. that's incredible. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and then, it, it, then, G Actually, the story has Jesus come after his resurrection, and because in the book becomes a second witness for Jesus. Jesus comes after his resurrection in the old world, comes to America, and shows himself, and they write wow. about it. And it becomes the Book of Mormon becomes a second witness for Jesus's resurrection, hmm. and uh, then they exist four hundred more years. This one, uh, the righteous group, turns unrighteous. And they get destroyed by the by the more wicked part, and which become the Native Americans. Mm. So the book, the Book of Mormon, was buried by this Moroni, the last prophet to write in the book. And uh, then he appears to Joe Smith and tells him where it's hidden in New York, mm -hmm. okay? near a hill, uh, in a hill near his farm incidentally and joseph goes and he gets this well he looks at the plates he's not allowed to take them for four more years what are the plates tell us about the plates okay, the, or what they say the plates are. yeah the plates are gold sand mm -hmm. plates a stack about according to joseph's description six inches thick of plates mm -hmm. about eight by six inches and um they're written on in this strange language of a mixture of reformed egyptian and hebrew mm -hmm. and they uh, joseph smith is uh, takes them in 1827 finally and he, his mission is to translate them into english now no one is allowed to see the plates and except for some special witnesses that come along later after the books translated and um, and it's usually, it's in a visionary, according to Mormons, three of them is in a vision and eight of them actually see the actual physical plates, which is disputed. We're, we're going to come back to that, but just yeah. to reiterate, so three of them see it in like a trance or something or a, a dream, in a vision, but then, in but a then vision. eight supposedly physically see the plates. Yeah. Okay. Is the understanding of your average Mormon. Mm-hmm. Right. I know you've written a lot about that and you've, uh, I've seen you, you, by the way, Dan Vogel has this amazing, uh, YouTube channel with yeah. videos that are, I mean, it's incredible. You have these videos that are at the level of actually, let's be honest, probably above the level of most academic journal articles. Yeah. And you have those as YouTube videos. It's kind of an incredible well, thing. I treat them like, uh, lectures. Mm -hmm. That's how I, I envision. I try to keep them under an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, like, no, they're like really impressive. 
Um, and all right, so so we've got uh, he has these plates, according to the story, and um, what does he do with the plates? What year are we in at this point? 1827. 1827. September 1827. Mm-hmm. September 22nd, which is the... Um, it's an equinox, right? Uh, in equ- well, it's near. near. It's, it's with... Mm. I forget each year that he supposedly goes back to this hill mm-hmm. coincides with either a new moon a oh. full, or a full moon. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Full moon makes more sense because he's going at night, right? And and you can actually see at night with a full moon. So, but yeah, but with a new moon, you can't see at all. <laughs> right. So there's some. So you're going to suggest, I presume, that there's some uh, mystical or occult astrological astrological reason. significance to that. But we'll get back to the, to the critical approach later. All right. So he's got the plates according to the official story, and well, and then his. Uh, he has uh, people. Uh, people are trying to get the plates. Why do they want the plates? Well, the, in the official Mormon accounts, there's yeah. they, they, there's no real uh, reason. Oh, okay, so we'll <laughs> save that for the the critical <laughs> approach. Fair enough. There is yeah. real, no real reason who these okay. who are these people that want these plates. These are mysterious they're, people they're who just, want to. Steal. Well, maybe they want to stop the restoration because Satan sent them. I don't know. I'm making stuff up, it. right? I have no idea. That's it. That's they're, they're persecuting Joseph Smith. Ah, okay. Now, look, to, he was persecuted. Let's let's be fair, right? The man was tarred and feathered. Yeah. Uh, eventually, like that actually happened, didn't it? That he was tarred and feathered. Yes. And 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 we use that as a metaphor and expression. That's some serious business. Yeah, it happened in 1831. <laughs> a few years. Yeah. A few yeah. years later. Um, Okay. But he was persecuted. Sure. Okay. All right. We'll get to that later. So he's got the plates in September 22nd, 1827. And so he can't do, he can't do much there in, in Manchester, New York, because it's Mm -hmm. too hot there for him. So he moves to his in-laws town Mm -hmm. down in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. About a hundred 20, 50 miles away uh, with his wife. He just, he, he also got married that same year just before this. Okay. So he and his wife moved to his in-laws place and they weren't too friendly to it either. Mm. But, uh, and then he and said, his father-in-law said something like, um, you can't be in the house if there's something here I'm not allowed to see. Yeah, and uh, I I I recently became a father, and I actually used that line on my son. <laughs> I said, "Hey, you don't have to live in my house. You're a grown man. If you're going to do something in my house that I'm not allowed to see, don't do it here." <laughs> I actually stole that line from uh, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Hale. Uh, Isaac Hale. Isaac Hale. Yeah. So yeah, it was a good line. <laughs> so yeah, he, he, he Joe Smith brought the plates, and they were in a box, and they were. Hale was allowed to lift them, but he couldn't see them. So that's really interesting. We're, we're going to come back to that because that's part of the the uh, critical approach. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he said, "Yeah, you can't keep the plates in here if I'm not allowed to see them." So Joseph supposedly hid them out in the woods, buried them, buried them, and hid them in the woods, and uh, until he got his own house, he eventually got his own thirteen acres over here near Isaac Hale's house, closer to the Susquehanna River. So it, it happens to be right in, in the, this what, the area known as the Great Bend, where the Susquehanna River bends around this mountain, mm. around this huge mountain. Not huge. Okay. It's a hill. It's not that, but it bends around it. It's called the Great Bend area. And uh, he, he lived at the foot of that hill you know, near the river. And uh, in this little house, he, uh, in the upstairs portion of it, he uh, dictated this translation to uh, different scribes. Some, uh, Emma, Hale, Emma Hale Smith, his wife, was a scribe. Then Martin Harris, who was a benefactor of Joseph Smith that helped him financially and helped actually eventually published the Book of Mormon. 
And uh, Oliver Cowdery, who was the main, who ended up being the main scribe, but he he doesn't come on the scene for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. he starts. Uh, he doesn't. He he dictates the Book of Mormon, and the average Mormon believes uh, until recently that uh, he dictated it using this instrument called the Urim and Thummim. Mm. That's something we know from the Hebrew Bible, the Ulim Vitumim, yeah. which we actually don't know what it is. Um, but in, in, the, in the book of Exodus, and then it appears like very briefly in like two other passages, it's in Ezra, and I think it's in, uh, maybe in Samuel, I think, um, like very vague references to, it seems to be what you could call a prophetic device. So that seems kind of appropriate. Um, how it worked or what exactly it did, we, we just know the high priest in the temple not necessarily in the temple. The high priest carried it and he would ask, he would somehow get a revelation through it when he didn't know the judgment in a certain matter. That's what's indicated in, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. And then it's not there in the second temple period, right? That's what Ezra mentions, that we don't have the, yeah. the judgment of the Urim. Okay, so now he has waiting, something called... Waiting for a priest to come. Right, exactly. We're waiting for a restoration. So Joseph Smith, <laughs> I guess, claims that's him. Um and look, Jews are still waiting for that restoration, yeah. uh, believing Jews. So, so what was his or, or, Urim and Thummim? It, well, we don't even know what it was in the Old Testament. Like it wasn't it said, called so. uh, Urim and Thummim for several years later. Okay, what do Mormons believe it was? It wasn't you even saying... associated with the Urim and Thummim. That was all part of the story mm -hmm. of Joseph Smith trying to mainstream his story. Okay. At first, at first it were it was spectacles they they okay. were two stones joined together it says in the book itself by a silver bow like like a figure eight okay that's in the book of mormon itself i didn't realize that it's yeah it says uh that these uh interpreters and they were oh. only used to translate really in in the book of mormon Okay. Um, they weren't associated with the breastplate or anything like that. They were just interpreters. And wait, tell us about the breastplate. So that's also part of the story yeah. that there oh, is a breastplate mentioned in the early story, but it's only Laban's, the uh, one of the characters in the Book of Mormon in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, they just take his breastplate and sword with them, and there it's not connected in any way to these spectacles or this, these interpreters is what the Book of Mormon calls it because they're used okay. to translate and, the book. And so the belief of Mormon, and I, by the way, let's, let's, a little side point, the word Mormon, I know there are some LDS folks today who are not comfortable with that term, but did Joseph Smith call himself a Mormon? Yeah, he called his people the Mormons. Okay, but so if, if, if it Joseph Smith used that. wasn't anything he made up. Okay. It if was, Joseph Smith used that term, then I think it's it's fair to use that term. And by the way, Mormons doesn't just refer to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Aren't there other religious groups today that also are part of the word Mormon? Is that right? Is that well? They they have never used the term Mormon uh, applied to, let's say, the uh, reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day. Oh, they never call themselves Mormons. No. Okay. Do scholars do refer to them church? as Mormons? It only stuck with the Utah church. Oh, okay. All right. So, but, but in history, I think it's not wrong to talk about, it's like if we were talking about the time of Moses, we would talk about Israelites rather than Jews. So I think it's not inappropriate to say Mormons when we're talking about the historical period where they use that term. Would you agree with that or? People, uh, the, recently the leader of the church, want, um, Requested to be called Latter Day Saints, okay, because that's what they're Latter Day Saints, mm -hmm. and uh, the Mormon uh, nickname came about because they were called Mormons, Mormonites. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't necessarily a, for der, uh, as der, for derision, you know, like to mm -hmm. insult them. It's because they believed the Book of Mormon, and that's how they got label you know it's well and this is a period of history where muslims were called mohammedans right so <laughs> um 
All right. I mean, uh, but then Christians, yeah. well, even the term Christians is they follow Christ, right? So, okay. In any event, okay. um, so, so the, so where are we in the story? Uh, I lost my place. <laughs> so, uh, so we're so, translating the book of yeah. Mormon and, yeah. how, and, and the average Mormon, uh, believes it's done by, uh, this Urim and Thummim from, ah, okay. from behind a curtain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Joseph Smith attached it to the breastplate. It's like Aaron's breastplate. It, okay. no, the original story had nothing to do with any of that. But so, so their description, if I understand correctly, is he's wearing something called a breastplate. Yeah. And there's like a piece of metal or something that comes off and puts these uh, um, what you call spectacles or yeah. interpreters over his eyes. And he looks through some sort of stones. Yeah. And he sees the translation. Yeah. Okay. That's their narrative. In okay. English. That, yeah. uh, in King to, James English, not in his dialect of English. Right. Well, it's a translation, right. and he uses okay. that as a uh, means of translating and uh, mm. using script, what people would expect Scripture to sound like. Mm. Okay. So, uh, this, uh, so the spectacles, these... Uh, was never associated with the breastplate like what you just described. That, mm. that, that description came out of Joseph Smith's brother, William Smith, years later. As, oh, really? And I don't know, I do not know how he got that story. But the breastplate and the spectacles were never associated in, together until 1838. Before mm. that, they were separate. <laughs> they had nothing to do with each other. And, um, oh, really? Yeah. So that's how the story is evolving. And, and so mm -hmm. instead of uh, what Joseph Smith was trying to do, by, and, and other early Mormon apologists, Mormonism is an apologetic <laughs> movement from the day one almost, you know? Tell us what that means, apologetic, because some of the audience member will think it, it means they're apologizing. The faith, you know, defending right. the faith. But okay. so they're, they're argumentative towards other Christian groups right off to... Okay, so ap apologetics doesn't mean... Right. Apologetics doesn't mean you're apologizing for those who don't know. No. It, it's from the a Greek word that means to defend. So, so by their nature, you're saying Mormonism yeah. is defending itself specifically against Protestantism, right? Meaning it's yeah. not defending itself against Islam or Judaism, I don't think, is that... I mean, by no, and large. They, that wasn't their focus. Okay. It's right. trying to convert other Christians. Okay, is their focus, right. and makes sense. It, to to Native Americans mm. next, primarily, which who they believe are Israelites mm -hmm. from the tribe of Ephraim. Right. Uh, well, not entirely from Ephraim, if I or remember. Manasseh. Well, we we can come back to that. Uh, but it's Manasseh. Right. Well, so I mean, anyway, let's come back to that. all right. So he's yeah. translating the Book of Mormon, and uh, he's using these spectacles according to the narrative. And then what happens? So he trans he translates there in Harmony, Pennsylvania, for a mm -hmm. time in eighteen twenty eight, yeah. and yeah. he um, gets a manuscript of of about one hundred and sixteen pages. But mm -hmm. nobody knows what really size it was, but it became known as the lost 116 pages because he loses it. Mm -hmm. His scribe, Martin Harris, wanted to take it back, the manuscript back to yeah. Elmira with him to show it off to his wife, unbelieving wife and relatives to show them, look, this is a great book and read parts to them and, you know, just say, I'm not wasting my time or money. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but it ends up getting stolen and lost. Wow. There was no other copy. Wow. So this becomes a crisis, a translation crisis for Joseph Smith. What does he do in light of this? Um, since I, it, it appears that he's just like dictating a largely off the top of his head, or, you know, I, I'm sure he prepares, but uh, he can't duplicate it. But, but the Mormon belief is that he's not making this up. He's looking sure. through the spectacles and he's seeing the translation and he's dictating word for word. Yes. So he should be able to do it again. You would think. 
but sure. he so this he becomes, that's why it's such a crisis okay <laughs> it's it's a crisis because he can't he can't do it but he blames he gets a revelation out mm-hmm. of it from the year and he gets a separate revelation it has nothing to do with the book of mormon but it's it's his direct revelation with god and th- these are the first direct revelations from god that he gets during oh, really? the crisis period so, so this is an important point. The Mormon yeah. scriptures isn't just the Book of Mormon or the LDS scriptures. Yeah. It isn't just the Book of Mormon. It's also something called the Doctrine and Covenants that you've also done some critical work on. We'll get to that hopefully later. Because that I, I actually didn't know that when I started researching this. I find that fascinating that they have this entire oral law. I'm going to call it that. Um, no, which they is have suppl- a law. <laughs> well, it's supplemental to the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Uh, and then they also have the Book of Abraham, and they have um, maybe some, uh, oh, they have uh, Pearl of Great Price, right? They've got a bunch of of things in their scriptures, which isn't just the Book of Mormon. I actually didn't realize that yeah. um, until, you know, rel- about a year ago when I started researching this. So, um, okay. Well, it's, not, it's not clear when Joseph Smith mm-hmm. starts, if he's mm-hmm. just a translator, uh-huh. it's not clear that he's going to get revelations himself, Yeah, written revelations. Mm-hmm. where he dictates and they write it down and then they yeah. eventually get published that even when he's writing them down it's not it's not clear that he's going to publish this eventually at all so so i so here's where the analogy to me is so powerful cuz yeah. like when when paul sends in a letter to, uh, an epistle to the galatians I don't think he's thinking, oh, okay, now I've just added a book to the Bible. He's you thinking know, these Galatians have got to be set right because they're, they're you know, doing things wrong. Yeah. But then it becomes canonized. And, um, and here we can see this happening almost in real time with the, with, uh, the doctrines and covenants. Uh, is that, it's called DNC, doctrines and covenants? Yeah, the doctrine, uh, and, doctrine and covenants. Doctrine and covenants, Okay. Um, all right, so we'll come back to that. And there, there's covenants or, okay. you know, promises or... Right. And originally it's not called that. It's called the Book of Commandments, which well, I want to come back to that. Because yeah. that, that in itself is really fascinating. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's almost like their, their Mishnah and, and Talmud. I'm going to use the analogy here. Uh, yeah. It's obviously not the same thing, uh, but it has some analogies there. So, um, uh, or maybe if you, were a, if you were a Samaritan, you'd say it's like the Book of Joshua, right? From their perspective. <laughs> um, meaning something added to the Torah. So, so, um, so, so, all right. So he gets a revelation and the revelation is what, what do you do about the lost 116 pages? <laughs> the revelation says for him not to translate the same over again, because mm-hmm. the wicked and designing men have changed or altered the manuscript mm. so that if he tries to translate it again, it will read differently. And, he will. They will use that as evidence against him. Ah, uh, so it, so if, so God. that's really interesting. So, <laughs> so in other words, uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. So, if in the original 116 pages, he said, you know, Lehi was 24 years old or something. I'm making stuff up. It might not be in there. <laughs> and then when he redoes it, it he, Lehi is 25 years old. They'll say, ah, see, he's making it up, and he got the details wrong. That that's is that what it's implying? Yeah. Right. Okay. And Martin right. Harris, who was the yeah. scribe might remember some of that even, you know? Uh, so okay. uh, so he doesn't translate the same, but mm-hmm. uh, he doesn't have, he, he kind of fires uh, Martin Harris as the scribe. <laughs> okay, I think that was probably a good decision on his part if the guy, uh, you know, because Martin Harris had made some kind of an oath that he wasn't going to show it to more than three people and then he's showing it to everybody left and right and then he loses it. Yeah, and the thing is, is that Martin Harris had to ask Joseph Smith three times to take mm-hmm. the manuscript. Oh, wow. It was no, no, okay, <laughs> you know, and so and so he does, and, and he's not supposed to show it to anyone but his wife, but according okay. to Joseph Smith, he showed it to more people and broke his commandment, his covenant, <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's why he's being punished. And yeah. So for a while, he doesn't have a scribe except for his wife, you know, here and there. But uh, he eventually, a young man named Oliver Cowdery comes mm-hmm. along. And Oliver Cowdery uh, meets the Smith family in Manchester 
And he's a school teacher and he lives with the Smiths for a while and he learns about the plates and he becomes obsessed with the subject. Mm. Even has a dream where he sees these plates. Uh, wow. It says the Lord showed him the plates. Mm -hmm. And so he gets obsessed and he goes down to Harmony, Pennsylvania and becomes Joseph Smith's scribe for the rest of the Book of Mormon mm. as we have it. And He's but the main scribe, but actually there's a whole bunch of different scribes. I've, I've seen seen and looked at some of the stuff Royal Skousen has done where yeah. like there's one page with four different handwritings or something. Yeah, well, as the story progresses, he leaves uh, Harmony because it becomes too hot there for him to continue working. And he gets this opportunity to move back into New York to a town called Fayette, New York. Mm -hmm. which, which is about, um, I don't know, 30 miles east of Palmyra. Mm -hmm. And it's right by the Finger Lakes, you know, right there by the Finger Lakes. And they, and this family, the mm -hmm. Whitmer family lives there. Mm -hmm. And they're of German stock. And the the father, Peter Whitmer, still, you know, has an, a German accent. And they, they attend the, the Reformed, German Reformed Church right there. And um, they invite Joseph Smith up there and they, for the remainder of the translation of the Book of Mormon, which, which goes from, which is just one month, basically. Wow. As far, as far as we can tell, from the beginning of June 1829 to about the 1st of July 1829. Mm -hmm. and How, what is the time period in which he writes the entire, not including the 116 pages or whatever they were, uh, but the what we have today, how long a period was that written over? Well, Oliver Cowdery started in early April, 1829. Mm -hmm. So April and May, they are just dictating and Cowdery's writing uh, for a couple of months, April, May. And then they travel this 120 or 50 miles up to Fayette and do one month of June. Uh, so it's like a, about 90 days, roughly. So the entire book, which is over 500 pages, was written in 90 days. We're yeah. going to come back to that. That's a very important point. Um, I think from the Mormon perspective as well, it's an important point because they'll say that's the miracle, right? Um, and the Book of Mormon is meant to be a miracle. It's the uh, founding miracle of Mormonism. Right. And it was intended to be that. Hmm. So let's come back to that. I'm, I'm ready. I'm taking notes of things that we want to come back to. Yeah, sure. So he's he's finishes the Book of Mormon. Uh, it's tr it's he's actually dictating it while, according to them, looking through the spectacles. Um, uh, what happens next? So he finished it, when he's dictating. He's dictating in uh, up in Fayette. He's dictating the first part. Mm -hmm. So what he had done is continue from what we know as the Book of Mosiah to the end of the Book of Mormon Moroni in Manchester, from what we can tell. Mm -hmm. And then when they move to Fayette, they do the first part. Mm -hmm. And the first part goes quickly, mostly because it has about 20 chapters directly from the Book of Isaiah, King James Version. Mm. So we're only talking about, you know, less than 100 pages, but most of it's already been written, you know. So, so is their claim that when he was, and maybe this is something we should say for later, but let's, let's do it. So is their claim that when, he, um, when he's dictating Isaiah, that he's looking through the spectacles? Or is he opening up, he's saying, hey, Oliver, let's do chapter 49 of Isaiah. And then Oliver's transcribed, or he's reading it to him. What what is is there a specific claim about this? Yes, there's this. This is hotly contested as well. Ah, um, okay. So we have a few late nineteenth century statements, eighteen seventies, eighties, of some of the witness eyewitnesses describing what they saw when when they saw when they weren't doing their farm work. The Whitmers described Joseph Smith as. Uh, putting the stone uh, a stone in his hat and looking into the uh into the darkness of the hat mm. and reading off of that one stone 
the translation. And so they take from that that Joseph Smith never took his head out of the hat. <laughs> you know, and we're going to get back to the stone in the hat because that's an incredible, yeah, absolutely incredible. I mean, this is like we actually have the stone, which is like yes. the equivalent of having Moses' staff. I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I thought I'd never get to see that stone myself. But the church yeah. itself published the photos of the of the yeah. stone. Yeah. It's incredible. All right. Um, all right. So he's public he's finished re- transcribing the book or dictating the Book of Mormon. Uh, or authoring it, as you would believe. And then how does, what happens after that? So that's in 1829. It doesn't get published for another year. So what, what's going on? So while the trans, at the, in the month of June, they apply for the copyright in Utica, New York, actually. And they also go back, you know, the 30 miles over to uh, Palmyra and start negotiating for the publishing. Mm-hmm. And uh, with, uh, uh, Albert G. Grandin, Albert <laughs> Albert G. Grandin, who has a print shop and bookstore you know, on Main Street of Palmyra, and he turns it down. Um, and it's already known, <laughs> I think, or mm-hmm. Joseph Smith. It's kind of anti Masonic. You know, the Book of Mormon is anti. Book of Mormon has warnings against masonry. Ah, and this publisher is actually a mason, right? Yeah, and Grandin okay. is known as a Masonic pr- printer because he's okay. pro Jackson. He's pro okay. Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson in 1828 ran successfully for president. And, and back then, masonry, uh, Freemasonry, was a really big deal. Not like today, where. Well, I don't know if it's a big deal today or not, but it, it seems like it's less of a central issue in American society. Um, yeah. Back then, it was a big deal, right? Yeah, we'll get into that probably. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 but yeah, in Western New York especially, uh, it was the hotbed of anti-masonry. Okay. People just totally violently, and there, there were ch- churches that divided over that subject, you know? Wow. Yeah, you you couldn't be a member of our church if you're a Mason, you know, kind of a wow. idea. So it was hot. It was a hotly contested issue. And Andrew Jackson, being a Mason in the 1828 election in Western New York was the hot subject, okay? so And, and I want to point out, like, today, a lot of times, some people will, like, it becomes, like, the focus of conspiracy theories. Um mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't a conspiracy theory that Andrew Jackson was a Mason. He was openly and proudly a Mason, right? Yes. It okay. wasn't that much of an issue in other states. But it was in New York. Okay. West, Western New York, especially. Okay. And that's so, because of this guy who was murdered that maybe yeah. we won't get to, we'll maybe get we won't. That, but, we'll get right. into that. Uh, All right. So, so, but, Joseph, the Book of Mormon has prophecies in it about a secret combination in the last days mm-hmm. that shall kill and murder the prophets and the saints. And um, mm-hmm. so it's woven in to the Book of Mormon's narrative. And mm-hmm. Joseph Smith went to Grandin and Grandin said no. And then he went to Rochester and he went to this guy named Th- Thurlow Weed. And Thurlow Weed was the main publisher of a newspaper in Rochester that was anti-Masonic because he was against Jackson and he was using the masonry angle to try to, uh, you know, um, hurt Jackson's chances for being elected or voted uh, for in Mm -hmm. Western New York at least. Uh, So, and Thurlow Weed, he went to Thurlow Weed and he gave an exhibition of his uh, putting the stone in the hat and reading, uh, dictating stuff. And well, but to be clear, is this part of what Mormons believe, or is this just? Well, this we're is in just the critical a story. Order. This is just a story. They don't. But, they oh, don't we don't even know if this happened. Okay. Uh, I, I think we see his mother in her history talked about him going to Thurlow Weed, um, but okay. Thurlow Weed wrote a thing up about his experience. Uh, later on in the 50s. So, okay. Uh, Thurlow Weed turned it down. 
he didn't want okay. to he didn't want to do it. So Joseph Smith went mm-hmm. to this other guy, Elihu Marshall, and he was famous for a spelling book at the time. And I love these names. He's got like yeah. a, a name from the book of Job, Elihu. All right. Elihu, yeah. He he said, and he was a Quaker. Mm. And he said, he said, okay, I'll publish it. And so Joseph Smith went back to Grant and said, I can get it published, but I don't want to travel to Rochester, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh he still wanted uh Grandin to do it. And Grandin And you think the Quaker liked it because it was anti slavery? I don't I don't I don't think or, it's or he just wanted the money because he's doing a professional yeah, job, maybe. I don't know how he convinced him. Okay. But, but uh Martin Harris was of Quaker stock. Ah. Okay. So he might have had leverage that way. But okay. uh so Grandin said that he wouldn't publish it unless they put the money up first because he's not sure it's going to sell, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, Martin Harris put up his farm for uh, $3,000. Wow. That was a lot of money back then, $3,000. Yeah, and to print 5,000 copies, which is wow. a huge a lot, a lot, which kind of demonstrates the confidence of Joseph Smith. So just to give you an idea, in 2000 and when I, I self-published my first book and I did three about 3,000 copies and it probably cost about $5,000. That was in 2004. <laughs> um, but what, So that's actually incredible that it would cost... Well, his book was a lot longer than mine, so it's, the paper is the most mm-hmm. expensive part, probably. Um, so uh, certainly back then... The well, they were, the they were leather-bound. Oh, wow. Okay. So that also is expensive. Wow. Mine was paperback. Okay. So, but that's, that's, so yeah, that's a lot to print for a first run. Yeah. When you don't, uh, and, and, and by contrast as well, when academic books are published by Brill, for example, he does a lot of uh, Judaic studies, they will do between 750 and 1,000 copies. Today, that's not even the case. That was true 10 or 15 years ago. Today, they're going to print on demand. Yeah. Uh, for the 200 libraries around the world who buy the book, and that'll be it. If you want another one, you wait six weeks for them to yeah. do the print on demand. Um, and this is a very reputable publisher today uh, in, in Academia of Jewish Studies. Uh, so, um, and they do other stuff too. So, so uh, all right. Wow. So he's doing th- 5,000 copies, did you say, for $3,000? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That, that is a but lot eventually, of copies. Actually, they had to lower the price. Okay. Mm-hmm. What so, were they selling? Do we know what they were selling it for? Uh, I forget now. Okay. But it was probably in the neighborhood of a dollar. I mean, that, even well, that was a lot of money. It's going to be like right? in shillings. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I don't even know what that is or, or how that translates. All right. Um, like okay. Dollar 25, I think. Something okay. Dollar um, 75 down to. And, and what was, I think, I've heard plus. you talk about the monthly wage for digging the Erie Canal. What was that again? $12 a month. Twelve dollars a month, so a dollar seventy-five is a lot of money. <laughs> I think, a lot. yeah. So, um, so they Grandin agrees. Joseph Smith finishes the translation process. Uh, then they make a copy. You know, mm-hmm. they just try to, they make a what is a printer's copy, and then mm-hmm. Oliver Cowdery does. He's learned his lesson about giving the only copy over before right. the invention of uh, 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 scanning and photocopy machines. And yeah. all right, so they make a copy. So eventually, they start printing uh, mm-hmm. the Book of Mormon, and it takes a while. Um, I forget what month they started in, but they ended. Mm-hmm. The first copies came off the press in March of 1830. Yeah, and. Okay. Uh, I don't know how far much further you want to go. Well, we can say the rest is history. So, so, but, and, and it's not just, there's a lot more that happens between 1830 and when Joseph Smith is assassinated, murdered, killed in 1844. But I don't know that we'll have time to get to that. This has been a fascinating conversation, Dan. Uh, definitely kind of a first for me to uh, talk about, you know, a topic that I um, wish I knew a lot more about and hopefully I'll learn more about. I've already learned more about it just from talking to you. Uh, any, um, well, I want to say one final thing and then I'll let you say some final, um, closing remarks. Uh, if you felt, if you're watching this, listening to this and you have the burning feeling in your heart that, you know, Mm -hmm. tells you Joseph Smith is a true prophet and the book of Mormon is true. Far be it for me to tell you that that's not the case. 
Um, I was trying to have this conversation to, I'm not a believer as Mormons would define it. And so I want to understand what happened and how, more importantly for me, how I can apply that to other situations. And I think I've learned a lot from this process. Um, Dan, any final words? Oh, it was great being with you today. Uh, yeah. I've just recently came, uh, become aware of your show. Um, yeah. I must say that uh, I have a lot of Jewish relatives. My, okay. My wife is Jewish. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's, but she's a Christian now. Okay. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm nothing. Kind of like the Nephites, right? <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, the story in the Book of Mormon is that you, and we didn't even really talk about this, is that you had these, um, these Jews who came to believe in Jesus even hundreds of years before he came. And uh, so oh, that's, that's it, you know, and you're, I was kind of making a joke there, but, but there is an interesting, uh, you know, Jesus-believing Jews, according to the Book of Mormon. Um, in some respects, the Book of Mormon is what you would have expected to find in the Old Testament if Christianity is true. Um, in, in other words, you have people openly saying hundreds of years before Jesus that, you know, God's coming down, go, is coming soon, and uh, he's, you know, he's, he's going to come down to earth, uh, right? Meaning like, um, what, that's the way that Isaiah is interpreted, but it's explicitly stated in the Book of Mormon. Um, yes. yeah, by Christians. So, so I think that's really interesting. Um, anyway, thanks so much for all your time. Uh, thanks for having we, me. We, we, uh, I, I hope we are able to broadcast all of this. We've been recording at this mm -hmm. point, guys. I think this is a personal record for me. We've been recording for, I, I want to say, um, almost like seven and a half hours or something like that. So thanks so much. All right. All right. Hello. Goodbye. Thank you. Tell them to your wife. <laughs> you have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.